Number one, the Black Prince. Weirdly, the Black Prince is one of my favourite tanks of all time. It was the final development of the Churchill tank series. Churchills were big, slow, heavy tanks designed to support infantry in battle. Due to their really long tracks, with lots of wheels, <coughs> they had good terrain resistance, meaning they could get up slopes that no other tank could. The guns on Churchill tanks tended to be quite small, because a lot of the time they fired high explosive rounds at infantry positions. It was never really intended for tank busting. Despite this, it was a Churchill tank in North Africa that jammed the gun and turret of a Tiger tank, causing the crew to evacuate, and that's the reason we have Tiger 131, the only working Tiger tank in the world. The Black Prince was even bigger than its Churchill predecessors. It was a foot taller than the Churchill, 8 inches wider, 4 feet longer, and a whopping 10 tonnes heavier. The total weight was in the region of 50 tonnes, bringing it up on a par with the Tiger tank. All of these modifications were intended so that it could have a better gun suited to tank killing, in the form of the British 17-pounder. This is the same gun fitted to the Sherman Firefly, a tank thought to have killed the best Tiger race in World War II, Michael Vittman. Despite being bigger and having a better gun than Churchill, it was much slower, and Churchills were pretty slow to begin with. A Churchill could do 15 miles an hour on a road, and the Black Prince could only manage 10. They increased the weight, but didn't put a better engine in. Plans were in place to put a Rolls-Royce Meteor engine in, which would have almost doubled the horsepower, but this never happened. Designed in 1943, only six prototype Black Princes were made by the end of the war, and by then tank ethos had changed. In 1945, the Universal Tank was all the rage, and Britain had arguably built the first one in the form of the Centurion. This evolved into the main battle tank ethos that most nations still have today. With no place in the lineup left, five of the six prototypes were broken up and used as range targets or spare parts. Prototype number four is still in working condition, however, and lives at the Bovington Tank Museum here in the UK. The Black Prince tanks never saw active service, but Churchill's themselves had a long career starting in 1941 and went right through to the Korean War. They were finally taken out of service in the British Army in 1952. Number two, the T-28. Is this a turretless tank or a very heavily armoured tank destroyer? Even the builders weren't sure. This huge tank was originally called the Heavy Tank T-95, but was reclassified to fit in with the other US heavy tanks in the line, and so called the Super Heavy Tank T-28. The Allies in World War II realised that at some point they would have to smash through the Siegfried line of defences held by the Nazis. To do that they needed a big gun on a very heavily armoured tank. To give a sense of scale, the mighty Tiger tank began the German Super Heavy Tank line. It weighed around 50 tonnes and had an 88mm gun. The American T-28 Super Heavy weighed 100 tonnes and had a 105mm gun. It was the heaviest tank ever built for the US military, and one of the slowest with a top speed of 8 miles an hour. The gun was mounted on the hull, but could traverse 10 degrees left and right, so they didn't always have to move the whole tank to aim the gun. To take the vast weight, they had to add a second set of tracks to spread the load. The armour in places was a foot thick, which would have protected it against Tigers and even Tiger IIs had it ever seen service. There was a German tank being designed that may have given the T-28 trouble, but we'll get to that in a minute. By the time a working prototype T-28 had been built, the Siegfried line had already fallen to the Allies. Construction continued and they built a second one, hoping to take them to Japan and fight on Japanese soil after Europe was liberated. However, after the two atomic bombs, Japan surrendered, and suddenly there was no need for a 100-ton tank anymore. The two prototypes were put through trials until around uh, 1947. One of the prototypes suffered an engine fire, which led to it being scrapped. Trials concluded that the vehicle was too slow for a modern battle battlefield. Bearing in mind that some World War I tanks could move at 8 miles an hour, or more, the T-28 could only manage 8 miles an hour. It was too heavy for most bridges, so transporting it was an issue. Its weight and lack of power meant that it struggled to climb obstacles, which was the very purpose of tanks. And with no turret, it would have been susceptible to flanking attacks by smaller and faster tanks. The conclusion was that it held no place in the battle line of the US military. It did help develop the heavy tank design though, and the gun was used on the T-29 heavy tank, but mounted on a turret this time. There was also the T-30 heavy tank that also had a turret, but added a bigger 155mm gun. Neither of these saw the battlefield either. The T-28 programme was closed for good in October 1947, and then the prototype disappears from the records. In 1974, its rusting hull was found in a field at, um, well, it's, 
I think in England we'd pronounce it Fort Beaver, but I, I'm going to say Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Correct me in the uh, comments if you will. It's since been restored to a display condition and is on show at Fort Benning, Georgia. Number three, the tortoise. Think of this as Britain's version of the T-28. Devised in 1943, a year earlier than the T-28, the tortoise was Britain's answer to the Siegfried line problem and emphasised armour and firepower over mobility. The design began originally with a turreted gun, but after 18 different designs the manufacturers finally settled on one to put into production. Referring back to our old friend the Tiger Tank, at 50 tonnes with an 88mm gun, the tortoise weighed in at 80 tonnes and had a 94mm gun, commonly referred to as the 32 pounder. By 1944 the design was complete and the War Office ordered 25 vehicles to be built. However, the war ended before they were finished, so five were built without even bothering with prototypes. These were sent to Germany for testing where it was found to be mechanically reliable and a very accurate gun platform. The gun itself was tested against a Panther tank and even when hitting the gun mantlet the shots penetrated. It was also a very effective bunker buster. Like the T-28 it lacked a turret, but unlike the T-28 the tortoise's gun was mounted on a ball joint which gave it much more lateral movement. Its gun could traverse 20 degrees left and right compared to the T-28's 10 degrees. Where the T-28 had a crew of just four, the tortoise needed a crew of seven. It took two men just to load the gun. To move its fast weight they fitted it with a 600 horsepower V12 Meteor engine, which was a modification of the Merlin engine in a Spitfire. Despite a large engine, it could only manage a top speed of 12 miles an hour on a road and just 4 miles an hour off-road. Nobody knows why it's called the Tortoise, especially when most British tanks of the time had names that began with the C or a V, but with a maximum top speed of 12 miles an hour, I think it lived up to its name. Very few bridges could take its weight and its overall size made it difficult to transport. It took two heavy hauling lorries to move it. Much like other heavy tanks on this list, the idea of the heavy assault tank was dropped in favour of the universal tank. Two tortoises remain in existence, one on Ministry of Defence land in Scotland and one working model at the Bovington Tank Museum in the UK. It's the second heaviest vehicle at the museum and they've got some enormous vehicles there. Tank number four, the Object 279. This is one of the strangest vehicles on this list and in terms of time period it's much later than any others. Work began on this tank at the Kirov plant in Leningrad in 1957 and was completed in 1959. It was an experimental tank design to go places that no other tank could. And no, it's not into space. The Soviets were thinking in terms of crossing Europe and having a tank that could go anywhere regardless of the terrain. Regards its shape, the Russians had put forward arguably the first tank with sloped armour in the form of the T-34 back in World War II. This tank appears to have taken the sloped armour idea and run with it. Its somewhat odd, almost flying saucer-shaped hull is thought to help defend against a nuclear explosion should the tank happen to be anywhere near one. You can say what you like about the Soviet Union, but at least they thought of every eventuality. The whole vehicle weighed in at 60 tonnes and the armour was 12 inches thick in places. The two main features that stand out compared to other tanks is the four sets of tracks which help it move over whatever terrain it wants. Despite its 60 tonne mass, this tank could cross terrain that much lighter tanks and vehicles couldn't cross because the pressure on each track was reduced. The unusual shaped body is the other prominent feature. What you see is actually more of a cover than armour. It's more like spaced armour to protect against high explosive anti-tank ammunition, commonly known as heat. Much like the cages you see on fighting vehicles today that are designed to detonate an RPG before it hits the vehicle itself. The shape of it is designed to push the tank downwards in the event of a nuclear blast wave hitting it, which would flip over regular tanks. The gun is worth mentioning as well. It had a 130mm gun and a semi-automatic loading mechanism, along with various rangefinders and lots of modern technology. Most main battle tanks today only have a 120mm gun, so this tank from the 50s had a bigger gun than modern tanks. Only three were built. Tests showed that it had superior terrain crossing abilities and could even manage several anti-tank obstacles such as Czech hedgehogs. However, it was discovered to be difficult to repair and maintain the tracks. If one of the middle tracks was lost in a battle situation, it would be next to impossible to repair them. Much like other heavy tank designs, it was decided it was too heavy for bridges, so transport was an issue. In 1959, Nikita Khrushchev cancelled Russia's heavy tank program in favour of guided missile technology and the tanks to fire them.
1960, he forbade any tank design to weigh more than 37 tonnes, thus favouring a more fast-paced form of warfare, if the Cold War ever turned hot. Only the original prototype, Object 279, remains, although not in working order. It's at the Kubinka Tank Museum in Moscow. Tank number five, the mouse. Now we get to the biggest beast on this list. The mouse can be described as a rare example of a German joke. Most World War II era German tanks were named after cats. Tiger, Bengal, Tiger, Panther, Lynx. And this continued after the war with the Leopard. Why they suddenly switched to rodents, nobody knows. But when you consider that a Tiger tank weighs 50 tonnes, and a King Tiger is close to 70 tonnes, calling a 188 tonne super heavy tank a mouse is just taking the piss. This leviathan of a tank was a continuation of Hitler's obsession that bigger was better. Starting with the Tiger and the King Tiger, there was also a lion designed that could have been up to 90 tonnes. Then suddenly there's a huge jump to almost 200. If Tiger and King Tiger had 88mm guns, the mouse positively dwarfed theirs with 128mm. It also had a secondary gun mounted on the turrets that was 75mm. A lot of Allied tanks in World War II had main guns that were smaller than this. The original tanks in World War I were referred to as land ships, and this thing seems to fit the bill. There was another proposed design even bigger than the mouse, which would have had battleship guns fitted, but we'll get to that in another video. The mouse was designed by the legendary engineer Ferdinand Porsche, who is arguably most famous for designing the VW Beetle. Yeah, think about that next time you watch Herbie Goes Bananas. If bridges of the day struggled with 60 ton tanks, how do you think they coped with 188 tons? Simple, they didn't. If Porsche couldn't get the tank over a river, then he'd get it to go through the river. With its massive size, it could ford a river up to 2 metres deep, or fully submerged down to 8 metres deep using a snorkel to provide air to the crew. The submerged mouse would be connected by cable to a second mouse to power its electrical motors and drive it across the riverbed. The first model was completed in December 1943, but without a turret. The second prototype was built in 1944 and had a turret with a full complement of guns fitted. The vehicles never entered combat because neither were completely finished models. The second vehicle was destroyed by the Germans as they retreated away from the advancing Red Army. They set charges in the hull which would blow and take the ammunition on board with it. The damage to the body was irreparable, but the turret remained largely intact. Sort of shows you the strength of the um, build really, doesn't it? When World War II ended, the Russians used six of the largest German-built half-tracks weighing 18 tonnes each to pull the mouse turret off the wrecked body. The turret alone weighed 55 tonnes, and they somehow managed to mount it on the first prototype body. The vehicle was assembled in Russian-held parts of Germany and sent back to Russia for testing. Top speed was found to be around 8 miles an hour, even though theoretically it should have managed around 14 miles an hour. Like all super-heavy tanks, it was decided that the mouse was too impractical for the real world. The single surviving prototype was left on some tarmac near the Kubinka mu testing grounds, and then the later the museum was built round it. It holds the record for the largest enclosed armoured fighting vehicle ever built, and epi epitomises the idea that super heavy tanks don't work. Tanks have three main factors that they aspire towards. Firepower, mobility, and defensive armour. If it has too much of one factor, it sacrifices one of the others. Too much armour means very heavy weight, and therefore reduced mobility and speed. This makes it vulnerable to flanking manoeuvres, artillery, or air attack. Too little armour, and you've got a very fast light tank, but generally it'll have a small gun to keep the weight down, and very little protection if it does get hit. What have we learnt then? At the end of the Second World War, different tank classes of light, medium, cruiser, heavy, assault, and super heavy tanks were dropped in favour of the universal tank. This tank would have enough of the three main tank factors to be good at all of them and become a jack of all trades. The modern main battle tanks of today match this principle. If you look at tanks like the British Challenger II, the German Leopard II, or the American Abrams, they all weigh around 62 tonnes, they all have 120mm guns, they all move around 40 miles an hour on road and 25 miles an hour off road, they all have a crew of four consisting of a commander, a gunner, a loader, and a driver. All of this suggests we have reached the peak of tank design, and only significant changes in technology and battlefield tactics will stop the main battle tank being used in the future. Thank you.